Man, today we're talking about peace. Uh, recently, just to open up with a, a small story, um, I went to Dollar Tree probably like uh, five, six days ago and uh, get to the cash register and ladies, you know, ringing up all my stuff. And um, we started talking and she is just talking about how everything going on in the world is crazy and it's, it's madness and uh, no one has peace. And I looked at her and I said, but do you have peace? You know, because you're talking about how the world has no peace and you're looking for world peace. Do you have peace? And she goes, no, I don't. Um, she was desperate for, for peace, peace of mind, peace of heart, emotional peace. Even though she couldn't articulate it well, what she was really after uh, throughout the conversation was she wanted wholeness. She wanted completeness and she was looking for the world to give her that. She was looking into the world for that. I'm waiting for the world to be complete. I'm waiting for everyone to get along and have peace. And that's why I said, but do you have peace? And she said, no, I don't. And I said, you can today. And then I shared the gospel with her and I just shared how peace comes from knowing Jesus. It doesn't come from any set of worldly circumstances. It doesn't come from having the right house or the right job or, or the right, even the right perfect marriage and nothing goes wrong. It comes from knowing Jesus. And so <clears throat> there's this concept, especially in our culture, um, that says, well, peace is tranquility or the absence of difficulty. Peace is the absence of discomfort. Meaning if you have real peace, that means there's nothing difficult happening in your life. There's no trouble, there's no discomfort. That's not true. Uh, peace is not the absence of the storm or the pressure. It's actually being able to endure that and actually being able to like enjoy Jesus in the midst of that. Peace, biblically in the Hebrew, is shalom. Um, it means favor, completeness, wholeness, to be sound. Uh, refers to welfare, safety, security. Um, and though that does have physical ramifications and that does happen in a physical capacity, it's more about the spiritual inward soul level peace that God gives. So every single person on the planet, whoever's watching, everyone right now, you and I, everyone wants peace. Peace of heart, peace of mind, peace at, at the soul level. Um, but not many people want to do what actually is required to have peace. There's actually something that needs to happen in order to have that deep soul level peace that nothing can rob you of, no one can take from you. Um, but even more than a concept and an idea, since this is uh, episode eight on our series called Jesus Is, J peace is a person. More than just a principle, more than just an idea and a concept, peace is a person. In fact, if you go to Judges chapter six, we'll start in the Old Testament today and the, we'll, we'll work our way to Jesus. You need to understand if you want real peace, where you're, you're good, complete, satisfied, you're, you're, you're okay, regardless of what the circumstances of your life are, regardless of the political you know, climate, regardless of what's happening in the nation and the government, you can say, I am, I'm good. Like I have that, that sound kind of welfare at the core of who I am. I'm good, I'm complete. If you want that, well, you gotta know God. Because Judges chapter six, verse 24, <clears throat> Gideon builds an altar and he calls it, the Lord is peace. And he's not far off. He dedicates that altar to the Lord and he calls it the Lord is peace because guess what? The Lord is peace. The God of Israel is peace. You know, you go to Hebrews chapter 13, fast forward to the New Testament real fast. It says, may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will. Working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So the God of peace, the Lord is peace. First thing you have to understand as we navigate the Old Testament, as we'll work our way to Jesus, we'll get there. But there's a bunch of ideas you have to have along the way so that you can attach them to Jesus. When you see him, it'll make sense of the Old Testament. At least the Old Testament concept of peace. You'll see Jesus as the substance of that. That's my hope, is that you would see him as your peace. Not as some ideal circumstance, not as something he's going to do for you in your future. No, he is your peace right now. So if you go to Exodus, we have the peace offerings instituted in the Mosaic law. And so the nation of Israel <clears throat> had several different kinds of offerings they could bring to the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, as a way to um, uh, engage with or interact with the presence of, of God. So he dwelt among his people in the tabernacle and the, the, the offerings, the, this animal sacrificial system is a gift to Israel for them to be able to come close to God. 
It's a, it's a gift from God to them. It's not what God is, where God is saying, you know what, I demand all of this right now if you want me to stay. It's God saying, look, I will dwell among you, but I'm giving you the sacrificial system, not just to deal with the, the ritual impurity every year, but so that you can come near to the place where I dwell. It's a gift. And it is an expectation. It is a responsibility. But Exodus 20 verse 24 talks about the peace offering. <clears throat> and I really want you to see how Jesus actually is the fulfillment of this. So when I tell you Jesus is peace, you and I have a different idea of what that may look like in, in our lives. I want to give you a, a clear picture of what that really means. And we have to start with the sacrificial offerings because these peace offerings are instituted to foreshadow, predict, and even prophesy Jesus. So Exodus 20, 24, it says an altar of earth. Here are the commands regarding the peace offerings. Okay. God tells Moses to tell the people an altar of earth uh, of the dirt you shall make for me. Sacrifice on it your burnt offerings, okay, and your peace offerings. So peace offerings are different than burnt offerings. We see that in the beginning of Leviticus. Your sheep and your oxen. In every place where I cause my name to be remembered, right, I will come to you and bless you. So <clears throat> wherever God chooses to make his name dwell, later we'll see it's in Jerusalem. But for now, at the time of Moses receiving this, uh, it's you know, in the camp of the Israelites, as, they, as they're wandering, they'll set up camp and the tabernacle will be among them. But God is saying, look at the connection here. God coming to his people, God blessing them is actually connected to the peace offerings, not only, but also the burnt offerings, okay? So that's regarding the offerings in general and the peace offering plays a role in that. <clears throat> he says, in every place I cause my name to be remembered, I will come to you and bless you. Um, and the peace offerings, the bringing that to God is a part of God coming to his people and blessing them. Blessing them with the opportunity to draw near to them. Now you have to hold on to that because we're going to see exactly that idea in Ephesians chapter 2. Where Jesus gives us peace with God so we can come near to him in a brand new way, in a better way. Because Israel could only draw near through animal sacrifice, through the shedding of blood, through the priesthood. And they couldn't even have the presence of God dwelling in them by the spirit the way we do. They had to go through the temple sacrificial system. And this foreshadows Jesus who makes a better way to the Father. Okay, so God coming to his people and blessing them, it connects to the peace offering. It's a gift to Israel. It's not a burden because we look back and we're like, ah, sucks to shed blood all the time. Yeah, that would suck. <laughs> like that would, be, that would be normative though. It'd be as normal for us as like Netflix. That's just how normal it was for that culture. Because it was instituted, it became this, this, this ordinary, not ordinary, like it has no value, but a, but a thing that you just do. The priesthood would handle. You would bring sacrifices. It was a gift, though, to the people. Leviticus chapter 7, we're going to get some more insight on the peace offering. And this is going to make sense of what it means to have peace. I know for some this is boring, but I, I want you to see, like, if you understand peace rightly, you can, you can have a better experience of what Christ offers you called peace. Because if you misdefine peace, you'll, you'll go after something God actually doesn't call real peace and you'll spend your life pursuing that and, and straining and stressing for that while you're ignoring the real peace he's already made available to you in his son. So <clears throat> there are a lot of Christians doing this. They're defining peace wrong and they're going after a false idea of what it is and ignoring the real peace they already have as if they don't have it. Leviticus 7.11 <clears throat> says this is the law of the sacrifice of peace offerings that one may offer to the Lord, okay? If he offers it for a thanksgiving, okay? So a peace offering would be given, number one, for a thanksgiving. Then he shall offer it with thanksgiving, sacrifice, unleavened loaves mixed with oil, unleavened wafers smeared with oil, and loaves of fine flour well mixed with oil. I'm not going to spend time on those elements. With the sacrifice of his peace offerings for thanksgiving, he shall bring his offering with loaves of leavened bread. And from it, he'll offer one loaf from each offering as a gift to the Lord. So here we see the peace offering is a gift for a thanksgiving. It shall belong to the priest who throws the blood of the peace offerings and the flesh of the sacrifice of that peace offering for thanksgiving shall be eaten on the day of his offering. He shall not leave any of it until the morning. Okay, so that's a, that's a law. When it comes to the peace offering as a thanksgiving gift to God, don't leave any of it until the morning. But if the peace offering is a, is a vow offering, 
right? Or a free will offering. <clears throat> I'll highlight this. If the sacrifice is a, um, a vow offering or a free will offering, it shall be eaten on the day that he offers his sacrifice, and on the next day what remains of it shall be eaten. But what remains of the flesh of the sacrifice, watch this, in other words, what's left over from that sacrifice on the third day. Can you think of anything that happens on the third day? You see where I'm going with this? So anything that's left over on the third day shall be burned up with fire. In other words, it's, it's, you disregard it. You remove it. It's no longer useful after the third day. That's why Jesus, you might say, waited, to, um, waited a few days to go to Lazarus after he had died because he was you know, regarded as, well, there's no chance for him to come back. It's been three days. <clears throat> so if any of the flesh of the sacrifice is eaten on the third day, he who offers it shall not be accepted. It shall not be credited to him. It's tainted. And he who eats it shall bear his iniquity. So it seems as though the peace offering can be given in a, in a, in a free will kind of sense, right? Free will kind of sense where, think of it like this. Uh, uh, I guess Michael Heiser, uh, if I'm not confusing the offerings here, from what I remember in his teaching regarding the offerings, he'll talk about how the peace offering is kind of like a housewarming gift, you might say. No one's forcing you to bring it. You're, free, you're bringing it out of your own free will as a, as a kind of, hey, glad you're in the neighborhood. I'd like to, not like make peace, like don't kill me, but I'm letting you know I'm friendly. And I'm bringing you a gift to let you know you are welcome here in this neighborhood. That's the kind of idea when it comes to the peace offering. It's, a, it's an offering of thanksgiving. And God dwells among his people. The people are bringing their gifts and saying, you're welcome here. We are thankful that you're here. Like we are not hostile towards you. We are friendly toward you. And we want you to stay among us. And then that can look like a vow offering or a free will offering. Um, if I'm not mistaken, those fall under the category of peace offerings. And now I want to correct myself because, first of all, my voice cracks. But second of all, I don't want to be called out as a, a false teacher for mixing up the offerings. So you got burnt offering, you got grain offering, you got peace offering, you got sin offerings. Guilt offerings. Yeah, cool. So I'm not wrong. The free will offerings and those, um, the vow offerings are, fall under the category of peace offerings, okay? And it's connected to, hey, what's left over for the third day when it's a vow or free will offering, a peace offering you give, what's left over into the third day, burn it up. It's no longer useful, <clears throat> okay? Don't have anything to do with it. Otherwise, it won't be credited to you. So there's a kind of crediting to the person on the part of the offering. When they bring a peace offering, it's credited to the individual, not the nation as a whole. Like this is not a national offering. It is, you know, prescribed for the nation of Israel, but the people are responsible individually for bringing their peace offering to God. Okay, Leviticus chapter 19, uh, verse five and six. It says, when you offer a sacrifice of peace offerings to the Lord, offer it so that you may be accepted, right? So there's that idea of, hey, it's to be accepted. And what that means, I think we'll figure out. It shall be eaten the same day you offer it or on the day after. And anything left until the third day shall be burned up with fire. There's that idea again. Is when it comes to the peace offering, don't leave anything over the third day. If, 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 if you do, like don't eat it. <clears throat> okay. And I think within that we see Jesus uh, and his third day resurrection. Where he would be regarded as useless. As uh, abandoned by God to the grave. Or he would be regarded among the Jewish people as done away with and discarded. That's why he was thrown out of the camp of Jerusalem and, um, you know, thrown out there on the cross and, and regarded as, as nothing among the people. That's the idea here. He takes that on. Um, it's the idea of the people are approaching God to have a kind of peace with him personally and say, hey, we are friendly. We want you to be among us. We want to be accepted among you. Um, here's our gift to you. We, lo we want a relationship with you. So we, we have that opportunity, and the Jewish nation has that in a, in, a, in a smaller sense, but we now in a greater sense. And I think Jesus takes the antithesis of that, the opposite, which is the, he takes the, um, the, you might say, hostility of God towards sin upon himself, the, the wrath of God, the judgment of God against sin, Jesus takes upon himself so that we can have this shalom, 
this peace. He was disregarded and, and regarded as useless and abandoned by God to the grave. Just like the third day, kind of what's left over, burn it up with fire, it's no longer useful. He, did, he took that so that we could have, I'm getting ahead of myself, so that we could have the peace he has with the Father. Um, Leviticus 22, 21. Here's the other thing I'll say about the, the peace offerings, okay? And then um, <clears throat> I won't be saying a lot more after this. Leviticus 22, 21. It says, when anyone offers a sacrifice of peace offerings to the Lord, to what? To fulfill a vow or as a free will offering. So a peace offering can be specifically a vow. It can be a free will offering, okay? Um, but you get to choose. If you're going to bring a peace offering to God and approach the tabernacle, it can be to fulfill a vow and say, I will do this, or a free will offering just saying, man, I'm so thankful that you have chosen us as your people and that you're among us, that you're so good. We want to thank you with these offerings of what you've given us. Not that you need it, but to let you know we acknowledge you're in charge, okay? And so to be accepted, it must be perfect. Now, this wasn't explicitly stated in the previous text, but that's why I'm giving you all these different elements of the peace offering to let you know it has to be perfect. What's left over to the third day cannot be eaten. Um, it's to be accepted. It's a free will offering of thanksgiving to say we love you. We want to draw near to you. We want to have a kind of relationship with you as a nation, but also individually. I want to come close to God. And not in the way that we can come close to God now, but it was through the animal sacrifice, but it has to be perfect. There shall be no blemish. That's why Jesus is the blameless, perfect, unblemished offering. There's no, you know, there's no uh, spot or blemish on him. Jesus is the perfect peace offering um, that is offered up on humanity's behalf unto the Father to say, I, I'm, I'm making way for the peace of humanity. Jesus offers himself up to give us that peace. Okay, so those are the ideas, at least in Leviticus, regarding the peace offering. When it comes to peace also, uh, you can have peace as a covenant. So Numbers chapter 25 talks about how God makes a covenant of peace with Phineas. Phineas is one of the sons of Aaron who actually stops the plague that breaks out on Israel because they're committing idolatry, sexual immorality, they're giving themselves over to false gods, and Phineas ends that by ending the life of the rebels. And God makes a covenant of peace, uh, terms and conditions you might say, an agreement. Just like a nation would come to another nation and say, hey, we'd like to make terms of peace or a covenant of peace with you. Deuteronomy chapter 20, uh, verse 10 through 12 um, tells us when the nation of Israel was to go and draw near to a city to fight against it, they were to offer terms of peace. They were to offer terms of peace. And I believe these specifically are the cities that are uh, outside of the promised land. I'm not entirely sure. I don't. Quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure this is not the, I don't think it matters. But the point is, he's, God is saying, when you draw near to a city, offer terms of peace. Give the opportunity for them to be in right relationship with you. And that's the other element of peace that you cannot overlook, is there is no peace without right relationship. There is no peace without the terms and, and agreement of that peace, the covenant of that peace. And God chose with the nation of Israel, hey, part of the peace, you can have the favor, the, the wholeness, the shalom, is that I've instituted the sacrificial system for you. So, and then he'll go on to talk about, if it responds to you peaceably, then all the people who are found in it shall do forced labor for you and shall serve you. So in other words, instead of taking over and killing everyone, offer peace and say, we'll bring you into the nation. Um, and the forced labor doesn't seem to be, doesn't say anything about unpaid just you're you're we're gonna we have a job for you and you're gonna you're gonna play your role in our nation when you when we bring you in but if it makes no peace with you make war against and it makes war against you besiege it this sounds a lot like when jesus sends the disciples out to the different towns then he goes hey if you walk into a house and that house has peace say peace be upon it like if they accept you if they don't remove your peace from it move on you know wipe the dust off your shoes and go on to the next town if it makes no peace with you so it's on the part of the nation or the city or the people to accept the terms of peace or to reject it. Either they want to make peace with both the nation of Israel and their God, or they don't. But there is a covenant of peace being offered, saying we don't want to bring hostility against you. If you war against us, 
we will destroy you, but we don't want to. So we're offering peace. You're starting to see Jesus a little bit clearer, aren't you? And the gospel of peace. He's offering us the terms of peace. He's bringing a covenant and the terms of agreement to say, I don't, I don't want to war against you. I came to save. I came to redeem and reconcile. I don't want to make war. I don't want to be hostile. But if you're an enemy of mine, I, you will be eliminated because you have no right in my kingdom if you remain an enemy and a child of the devil. So here's the terms of peace. Do you want it? Joshua chapter 9, verse 15. Joshua actually makes peace. Um, I want to say with the Gibeonites. Joshua, Joshua 9, 15. Um, they scheme and deceive Joshua and the people of Israel into the, yeah, the Gibeonites. So verse 15 says that Joshua actually made peace with them. So peace is an agreement. Like both parties have to agree that yes, we will live peaceably. We both agree to the terms of peace. If one presents peace and the other rejects it, then peace is not possible. Peace requires two agree, uh, agreeable parties. So Joshua makes peace with them because they come and ask and he makes a covenant to let them live to let them live. Part of the peace covenant, as we'll see, as we continue talking about peace, is that it, it, it includes life. It includes life. Malachi chapter two, verse five, it says, <clears throat> my covenant with him was one of life and peace, and I gave them to him. He's talking about Levi. God is talking about the covenant he made with Levi as the priesthood. My covenant with him was one of life and peace. I gave them to him. It was a covenant of fear. He feared me. He stood in awe of my name. So the covenant of peace includes life, which we already saw in Joshua 9. God gives that the terms of that covenant. We don't decide it. We don't get to, you know, figure out, you know what? Hold on, God. I'm not really liking these terms and conditions. You said I got to like turn from sin and believe in Christ. Is there another way? Can I like rewrite the terms? And God goes, <laughs> nope. You crazy. God gives the terms of peace. You either accept it or you don't. And if you, if you accept it, life comes with it. But that covenant does inc include not a, not a fear where I'm horrified, I'm terrified, but a fear where you stand in awe. It's a reverence. It's a respect. It's a trembling. It's a healthy trepidation. Okay? And what we've already seen in Leviticus 26, verse 6, I'll show you again, is that God is the one who gives peace. People can receive the terms of peace. People can align themselves with the conditions of peace. But it's ultimately God who writes the terms and conditions for the peace you have available. He gives it. He makes it possible. Um, so God is the source of peace. He is peace. He makes for peace. Um, I will give peace in the land and you shall lie down. None, of, none shall make you afraid. I will remove harmful beasts and the sword shall not go through your land. So the blessing of peace for the nation of Israel, should they actually obey the terms of the Sinai covenant, is that God will actually give them peace in the land among their enemies. Um, so that they actually destroy enemies who come against them. God will give them favor in war and actually help them, give them victory. And they'll be at peace in the land without fear of nations coming against them and losing and being overtaken. God will give them peace. So that kind of peace is specifically national. But the idea is, it has to do with the elimination of enemies. It has to do with this being um, secure in the word and the promise and the power of God. Numbers chapter 6, verse 24 through 26 tells us, The Lord bless you. This is the blessing of God upon his people. Um, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. And the Lord be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Now look at the way this blessing comes. Well, it's peace. It's God keeping, securing, guarding, protecting, caring for his people. It's the Lord making his face, it's his favor. This is God favorably shining the radiance of his face upon his people. This is the Lord being gracious to us, specifically to the nation of Israel here in number six, but we're going to see that flows into the Gentile world through Christ. The Lord lift up his countenance. This is God looking upon people for good and not for the judgment or consequence for their sin, but for good. So part of peace, God giving peace, it's going to require God looking favorably upon us. It's going to, be, it's going to require God keeping us, 
keeping our soul specifically. It's going to include God making his face shine upon us, being gracious and kind and compassionate and merciful to his people, lifting up his countenance and looking at us for good rather than for the consequences of sin. In other words, it's God looking at us to reward, to bless, and not to um, curse and, and judge. Okay? And God gives peace to a kind of person. Okay? Peace is given to a kind of person. Psalm 85, verse 7 through 13. It says, show us your steadfast love, O Lord. Grant us your salvation. Now I'm going to highlight all the words that are going to play into this concept of peace. And I'll show you. It's right. Um, I'll get to it. <laughs> Let me hear what the Lord God will speak. He will speak peace. Wow. So peace is the result of God's word. He's the one who declares peace. He makes for peace. If he says it's peace, if he says you have peace, you have it. If he doesn't, you can work tirelessly for your entire a, a million lifetimes and you'll never achieve real peace, rest, satisfaction, fulfillment, ease, wholeness, completeness. You can't achieve that on your own. The world can't give you that. But God can speak that to his people. He can make that a possibility and a reality. He speaks peace to his people, specifically his saints. His saints. So the Lord speaks. This is why Jesus being the word of God is literally him not just being a messenger of peace, but being the method of peace. He is the spoken word of the Lord to bring peace. That's why we believe in him, to give us peace, because he accomplished it for us. Let them not turn back to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness meet. I'm going to highlight all these different attributes that play into what it means to have peace. Okay, righteousness and peace kiss each other. Don't get weird, but the idea is they come together in this beautiful union. Righteousness and peace, two sides of the same coin. Meaning, if you want peace, righteousness is required. But also, the way that God gives peace is, righteous, is, is in a righteous way. Faithfulness springs up from the ground. Righteousness looks down from the sky. Yes, the Lord will give what is good. And our land will yield its increase. So for the nation of Israel, part of their concept of peace, when it came to them functioning as the chosen nation of God, is that their land uh, would experience increase. They would yield you know, a bunch of fruit and produce. That would be part of the fruit uh, of peace. Righteousness will go before him and make his footsteps away. And so this idea of righteousness and peace coming to a kind of person, those who fear the Lord, right? Peace is for those who fear the Lord in a reverence, respect kind of way where I honor and stand in awe of you, Lord. I, I stand in awe of your name, Lord. That's the kind of person who gets peace. It's the humble. It's the contrite. It's the meek. It's the one who's not self-sufficient, is not self-righteous, does not depend on themselves, but looks to God humbly and desperately, knowing they have nothing in and of themselves to sustain them, but God sustains them. And so they look to God for not just peace, but for the righteousness required to be at peace with him. Because it's the righteous who have peace with God. And part of that peace is that the steadfast love of God becomes mine forevermore. His faithfulness starts flowing into my life as his beloved child. Now that I've been born again, there's a kind of dimension to faithfulness and steadfast love that I get to experience now. I'm at peace. So if you're looking for peace, it's going to require you being righteous in the sight of God. You're going to need to meet the standard of God perfectly, never having made, you, you can't be imperfect. You have to be perfect, spotless, blameless. Now you and I are not that without Christ. No one is that on their own. But also, to be at peace means the love of God satisfies. In other words, part of peace is not looking at my life going, well, how good is my life going? Or how much do I have in the bank? Or how much do they love me? Or how much have I kicked this addiction? Peace is about God actually right now has committed loyal, steadfast love toward me that will not go up or down based on my performance, but it's constant, it's consistent, it's reliable. And his love towards me satisfies my soul and brings me to a place of mental peace, 
emotional peace, soul level heart peace, where I'm good, I'm complete, I'm satisfied, there's wholeness, I'm fulfilled because of his love for me, his faithfulness to me. Psalm chapter 119 verse 165 continues this idea that peace is for a kind of person. Psalm 119, <laughs> almost fell over. Psalm 119 verse 165, it says, Great peace, great peace, have those who love your law. So who is this for? The people who love the ways and the words and the law of God. They're not opposed to it. They're not rebellious. They're not standing in opposition to God's law. They love it. So there's great peace for them. Nothing can make them stumble. Do you know why? Because when you love his word, you build your life on his word, right? And his word stabilizes your life. His word stabilizes your emotions, your emotional health, your mental health, your life in general. God brings stability to your life through his word so that you're not shaky, so that you're not unstable, right? So the word of God brings that. So when you build your life on that, there's great peace. There's a sense of security that I'm not gonna fall because I'm building my life on something that can sustain me. I'm walking in a path and on a, in a set of ways that are actually guaranteed to work the way God has prescribed for them to. Nothing makes them stumble, especially eternally. Nothing can make you stumble eternally. There's great peace for those who love the law of God. That assumes they're, they, these people have a right relationship with God. That just doesn't seem like they're enemies. The fact that they love the law. Having the law is one thing. Loving God's laws and his ways is another. And so the, the more we grow in our love for God's ways and his word, the more we build our life on his word, the more we want to, and the more security that brings our, that brings our life, and the more of an experience of God's peace we can have real time. So you have to ask yourself, are you building your life on the word of God? Where in your life are you not? Where in your life have you settled and compromised? Where in your life have you decided, you know what, the word of God doesn't really get to tell me what to do here. But it can, you know, some of you are committed like with your finances to the word of God. You're committed in your relationships, but not your sexual purity. But not what you choose to engage in and what you choose to let your, your eyes watch and your ears hear. You're not as committed to that. You don't have standards for the media you entertain and the friends you hang out with and the people and the conversations you choose to, you know, entertain. You don't have the standard of, of God's word doesn't decide for you whether or not you'll engage in those things. But you're like, you know, I'm committed to God financially. And in my, in my, in my relationships, you know, I... Uh, I'm treating people well. Let's get everything, the, every category of life that we possibly can get. Let's all bring it under the authority of God's word. Let's let the word of God set the standard and drive my decisions when it comes to every single category of life. Let's not compartmentalize Jesus and go, well, if you want wholeness and completeness, like in an experiential kind of way, where you're walking in peace, it's one thing to have peace on the shelf available to you. It's another thing to open that bad boy up and actually like enjoy it. So if you want to enjoy and experience the peace that Jesus has purchased for you by offering himself up, it's going to take some effort on your end to actually walk in the ways of God, to actually look at your life and go, where have I not submitted to his authority? Where have I decided I know best and my ego gets the best of me and it actually causes my downfall? Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3 through 4. It talks about the kind of peace God gives for a person. You keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. So guess what? God is willing and able and wanting <clears throat> to keep his people in peace. The problem is we fluctuate in and out of the path of peace. We fall off the path. We stay off the path for a while. We wander off into other things. And we're like, oh, that'll give me peace. If I just get a better job and work tirelessly for that and even get sick and compromise my values at night because it has to keep me going, even if I have to get drunk just to keep my mind stayed on work, but I'm going to get that money, keep my family secure, get us financially stable. If, if you're going to live like that and wander off the path of God in the name of what, supporting your family in the name of, uh, well, we got to like bring stability to our lives and break these generational curses, but you're going to compromise your values in the process. The path of peace is marked out by God's word. If you wander off that, you shouldn't expect to experience and enjoy peace. Like the bottom line, peace is available. But there's a path that is marked out for us to experience and enjoy all the peace God has made available. 
Part of that means your mind is actually stayed on him and you trust in God. Those two things seem to be the prerequisite for obeying God and doing what he says is number one, I trust him. When I think I know best, I choose to, to admit and acknowledge, no, you know best, Lord. I don't. So I'm going to do what you say. Even when I think something else, even when my best friend told me, you really should reconsider, I'm going to do what you say because I trust you. And also watch this. I want my mind to be stayed on you throughout my day so that I'm more likely to stay on the path of peace, hold your hand the whole time, and enjoy the peace that comes from your presence and a relationship with you. So the kind of person who experiences peace is the person who consciously decides daily and throughout their day, every hour, every minute, as best as you can, try and remember, reel yourself back in, to keep your mind and your thoughts on the Lord and on His Word and meditate on the scripture and meditate on the character of God. Meditate on what he's done for you and who he is and what he's promised. And as you do, what you're saying is I trust you to lead me. So I'm going to dedicate my thought life to what honors you so I can walk in the path of peace. And he goes on, trust the Lord forever. Trust in him. The way you rely on a chair to keep you up. You're not like questioning the whole time. I don't know. This might break. I can't really enjoy myself and focus on work. You're not questioning whether a chair can hold you up when you just rest in it and sit on it. You go, this is going to hold me up. Same with God. Trust in Him. For the Lord God is an everlasting rock. Okay? I could go to Proverbs chapter 3 and say, look, long life. You know, I'm going to actually. It talks about wisdom. Wisdom. So you want peace? It's connected to wisdom. Like the, the, the more wise you become in Christ, Right? the more you start to live wise, which is going to be on the path of peace. So again, this is not how to attain peace, how to, uh, how to gain peace. God gives that in the form of covenant, right? Relationship, in the form of, um, what are the other things we talked about? Covenant, right? Relationship, um, righteousness, <coughs> um, making his face shine upon you with his favor. All that. We've already talked about, like, he gives peace, okay? And that's why he's going to give his son, and his son will give his life. But I'm talking about more like how to walk in peace. The Old Testament speaks to that. Proverbs, specifically wisdom here, it says, Long life is in her right hand. In her left hand are riches and honor. Look at Solomon. Her ways are of pleasantness, and watch, all her paths are what? Peace. And she's also a tree of life. Remember how I said peace and life go together? Peace, life, righteousness, all the different characteristics of who Jesus is, who God is, they come together so perfectly as if to be one and the same, yet distinguishable. There's peace. Well, you got to have life. Well, if you're going to be alive and have peace, right standing, righteousness is required, perfection. And that's why Jesus will offer himself as the blameless, perfect sacrifice. All her paths are peace. She's a tree of life. You want wisdom? Hold fast. Lay hold of wisdom. She'll bless you. God will bless you through your wise living. And it will come in the form of experiencing the peace he's made available through his son. You know, when Jesus is being declared by the angels to the shepherds, <clears throat> this is what they say. Glory to God in the highest. The angels are praising God. Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace among those with whom he's pleased. So again, the kind of person who has peace with God, fears God, reveres God, loves his ways, loves him. And that person is who God is pleased with. Right relationship, right standing, okay? But also, when we get to Isaiah chapter 9, you're going to start to see that peace is actually connected to a person. Now, we've seen the peace offerings, we've seen the peace covenants, we've seen people walking in peace and the kind of person that experiences the peace of God. God gives peace. He is peace. I know we're kind of flying through this. I don't mean to. I'm so excited to get to Jesus. But Isaiah chapter 9 tells us who will be born that will be the, the method of God's peace, the, distri the distribution of God's peace. To us, a child is born. To us, 
a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His name, the sum total of his character and all his attributes, who he is, his nature, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of his peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it, uphold it with justice and with righteousness. From this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. What's God going to do? Send his son. To do what? To make way for peace. So what? Why? So that we can be a part of his government and his kingdom and his nation and be citizens in his household. And he's going to uphold his kingdom and government with perfect everlasting peace and justice and righteousness. That's where we come in. Now, this is where we get into Ephesians 2.14. Jesus is peace. Ephesians 2.14. This is what it says about Christ. And it makes sense. What we see in Isaiah, what we see in the law of peace offerings, what we see in the covenant, the covenantal terms of peace God brings to nations and people and even his own individual, you know, people within Israel. It says he himself is our peace. And just to be clear, he is talking about Jesus here because in Christ we've been brought near by the blood of Christ. He is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two and so making peace. So we can go on and keep reading actually. He might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, killing the hostility. So remember all these different elements and ideas of when it comes to peace in the Old Testament, all the different details of peace come together in this passage with Christ. Number one, Jesus is our peace. Well, how? He's brought us near. Just like the peace offering would allow the nation of Israel individually to come near to the tabernacle or the temple, right? Jesus has brought us near by his blood, not animal sacrifice blood, by his blood. So we've been brought, we've been brought closer, nearer than the Israelite nation had access to God. We're closer to God than the Israelite nation was because they had the sacrificial offering system. They, they had the tabernacle and the priesthood and there was this, there was still this kind of distant element to their relationship with the God of Israel. The, the Lord was among them. He did prescribe the offering, the sacrificial offering so they can draw near, but it was not as near as we now can approach God spiritually by his very spirit so that we are seated with Christ in heavenly places and where he is, we are. That, that's how close we are. We can go and enter the throne room of God and approach his throne through the blood of the Messiah who shed his blood and laid down his life. He's the one who brings us near. Just like the peace offerings allowed the people to approach God. He is our peace, just like God declares himself to be peace in the Old Testament. Now, in what way is Jesus our peace? This is where we have to be honest and humble uh, because maybe a lot of us don't define peace the way Paul is about to. So hopefully this will give you a better understanding of what real peace looks like. He has made us both one. Jew, Gentile. Why, why thumbs? I don't know. Jew, Gentile. He's made us one family, one new humanity in Christ. That's why we're a new creation. We're the, we're the new humanity, new family of God, Jew and Gentile. Race doesn't matter. Gender doesn't matter. Age doesn't matter. Country of origin doesn't matter. Economic status doesn't matter. Religious background doesn't matter. It's do you believe the gospel? If, if you do, welcome into the family, whether you're Jew or Gentile. He's made us one. And he's broken down in his flesh, what? the dividing wall of hostility. Now, sin and our, our human evil and darkness was the real hostility. That was the real problem that had to be solved. How did Jesus solve it? By laying down his life, by paying our debt with his precious life and shedding blood that atones for sin because the life, the life of the creature is wrapped up in the blood. Not that Jesus is a creature, a created being, but I'm saying for us, 
The consequence of our sin, our crime, is death, the loss of life. So whoever is going to pay for our debt and take our consequences upon himself has to experience death and shed blood because the life is in his blood. Jesus does that. He's made us one. He breaks down the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances. There was a dividing wall, right? It wasn't just sin. It wasn't just human evil. That, that was the real issue, right? But Jesus also had to solve the, the issue. I'm going to call it for what, what it is. The issue of us not being able to go into the presence of God because of all the different things that had to be put in place and had to be perfectly met in order for us to, you know, only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement. So the dividing wall, you might say, the curtain that kept us out, what Hebrews talks about as um, the first, uh, what is it, first room, uh, holy place, most holy place, Hebrews talks about the holy place, um, which is like where they would have the the menorah, the table of showbread, the you know, and then it would go the holy of holies. That first <clears throat> room, the holy place, had to metaphorically uh, be removed, to, so that we can enter in through the body of Jesus into the holy of holies, um, and he does this by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, and making peace. So the peace involves the fulfilling of the law, the removing of sin and human evil that caused us to be enemies of God, that wall of hostility that was represented in the Mosaic uh, law of sacrifices and the priesthood and the cleansings and the rituals and all the stuff that essentially kept us from meeting the standard of God. Jesus meets that, fulfills that for us. And I've done a whole series on the law, so... For those of you that think I'm talking out of my butt, go watch the, I want to say it's like four episodes, like it's like seven, eight hours on the law. <laughs> That's how deep we go. Um, but Jesus fulfills that. He creates in himself one new man. So Jesus is now the, the glue that holds the family of God together. So the peace now is between humanity, new humanity. Everyone in Christ now has peace with each other. Because Jesus has taken away the dividing wall, not just between Jew and Gentile, but between humanity and God. And he makes peace. And then he reconciles us both to God in one body through the cross, killing that hostility. So on the cross, the hostility, being our sinfulness and our evil, that's killed in the flesh of Jesus. Romans chapter 8 tells us that in the flesh of Jesus, sin was condemned, sin was penalized and punished. Human evil was dealt with on the cross in the flesh of Jesus. And all the punishment for our sin was released upon his body as, you know, as human evil, you might say, all across human history took up residency in his body. Human evil is punished. The hostility is killed on the cross and he's buried. Jesus resurrects three days later. And now we can be reconciled, brought near, have a restored relationship with God through the cross through his life, death, and resurrection. So he makes us one new people. We are now righteous. We're now perfect. We have right standing and right relationship with God. So peace is about right relationship with God, which results in right relationship with each other since we're in the family of God. Now verse 17 says, He came and preached peace to those who are far and peace to those who are near. Through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So do you know what real peace is biblically? It's having right relationship with God. In other words, watch this. You can have the best possible life you can imagine. You can have that. At money, health, welfare, security, children, relationships, success in your job, influence, all that stuff that you think that will give me a sense of peace. That will give me a sense of Ooh, the storm is calm in my soul. You can have that. You can have that life. But without a relationship with God, you can't have real peace. You have temporary relief from your problems. You have temporary convenience. Because it's all going to come crumbling and toppling down. When you die and stand before the living God, none of that's going to amount to anything. Those 70, 80 years of like, I built my empire. And I'm, King Nebuchadnezzar had the same thing happen to him. 
his empire was brought toppling down. And he built that. No peace. No right relationship with God. You can have a right relationship with God, have a friendship with him, have a relationship with him as your father. And even if life is a living hell, you can have all the peace there is that every unbeliever on the planet is lacking and looking for and desperately grasping for. Peace is knowing God. Peace is having a relationship with him through his son. So you don't get to the father except through the son. Now that we have access in the spirit of God to the father, to his throne room, to his family, to his kingdom, to his inheritance, to his name, now that we have access to him, we have peace. We have Jesus who is our peace. He doesn't just make for peace. He doesn't just preach peace, which by the way, that's the message of the gospel. He is our peace. He is God's terms of peace to humanity. His son. My son is here. Jesus brings the message of peace, the terms of the covenant to say, if you trust in me, I'll take all human evil, pay your debt, make you righteous and perfect, raise you to life, bring you into the resurrection. Just trust and believe and repent of your sins. That's part of faith. Believe, have faith. That's what makes you right. That's what gives you right relationship with God. So if you want peace, it requires you to believe that Jesus is your only way to peace and your only way to be forgiven and your only way into the kingdom of God. No one else can grant you access and atone for or pay for your sins. He's our peace. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 2 makes a connection between this mysterious king. <clears throat> His name's Melchizedek. He's in Genesis. And he encounters Abraham. They have an interaction. And Jesus is, is somehow related to him. Some people will say that is, you know, uh, a Christophany like Melchizedek is actually like Jesus pre-incarnate. I'm on the fence about that. I'm not entirely sure. It's, it's a good argument. Like I studied this and it really seems like that's a, not too far off. But whoever Melchizedek is, this mysterious king figure, he's a priest and a king. And Hebrews chapter 7 verse 2, relating him to Jesus, it says first, by translation of his name, he's king of righteousness. Then he's king of Salem the king of peace. Jesus in Isaiah is called the prince of peace, right? But he is the anointed and crowned king of the universe. As he ascends to the father after his resurrection, when he's the first of resurrected humanity, and he succeeds where Adam and Eve failed as human, as human beings, Jesus succeeds. He's the king of all. So this king, Melchizedek, who is the king of peace, is connected to Jesus, who really is the true and better version of the king of peace, if in fact he's not Melchizedek here, but still a mysterious figure. Okay? So you and I go, okay, well, Jesus makes way for peace. Um, well, how does that practically make sense? I want to make sense of this for you because the better you understand like the details of the gospel and the logistics of our salvation, the the stronger your faith will be, the more stable you'll be, and the more secure you'll be, because understanding really does breed security. Understanding breeds confidence. So hopefully, that's what happens when I share with you, as we close, what it means that Jesus accomplished our peace. He is peace, right? But he also brings peace and makes a way for our right relationship with God, and our right relationship with our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. 2 Thessalonians 3.16, it says, May the Lord of peace himself, I can't get any clearer, <laughs> give you peace at all times in every way. So there's varieties of peace in terms of like, peace can touch different areas of my life. I can have peace in my relationships, but like stress and anxiety in my finances. So the Lord God who is peace himself who gives peace, he can give you peace, not just at all times, but in all ways. The Lord be with you all. So the peace that comes anytime, in any way, touching every area of my life, that requires God.
God to be with me. And guess what? He always is. God never leaves or forsakes. He doesn't abandon. He's our God, our Father forevermore. That promise guarantees you have access to peace any moment, any, any millisecond, in every way, in any environment, in any situation, in any difficulty and turmoil and heartache and suffering and pain and even the celebrations, you have peace because He, the Lord of peace, is with you. Romans chapter 5 verse 1 okay, tells us since we've been justified by faith, okay, our faith in Jesus is what gives us justification, um, where God declares you right. It's just as if you've never sinned. Yeah, I heard that before. So God declares you innocent, righteous, perfect, holy, spotless, blameless. He justifies you. He declares you innocent of your crimes because you believe in his son who actually can make you righteous. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus. So peace is about who you know, right? It's less about what's happening in my world and what's happening in my life and what's happening around me. And it's not even about what I'm thinking or what I'm feeling or my emotional health and my mental health. It's who do you know? Do you know him? If the answer is yes, you have peace anytime you want it. Now the way that peace will actually manifest in your life and to the degree that you'll experience, I'm sure there's variance. I'm sure there's nuance. I'm sure what you're expecting to look like peace won't actually be the peace God gives sometimes. You're going, okay, if I just, if I shut life down and I focus on your presence, I'll have peace. And all my problems will be solved. That's not peace. Your problems being solved in this world, that's not what makes peace. Peace is just focusing on Him and remembering what's ultimate reality, what's ultimately true. What God has declared, what He's accomplished, who He is, and what's going to happen in the future. That's where peace starts to flow in. But notice, since we've been justified by our faith in who? Jesus. So He makes way for our peace. He takes our hostility between us and God. He takes that upon Himself so that in his flesh, sin is condemned and the Father releases the righteous judgment and the just penalty against our human evil on his Son. Jesus takes that so we can have peace with God through him. So the only way to have peace is to believe in the Son. You don't have the Son, you don't have the Father, you don't have peace. Because Jesus justifies us. No one else can. Colossians 1.20 tells us that he's made peace by his cross. Now watch. Referring to Jesus, it says, in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. In other words, he's God in the flesh. Through him, through who? Through Jesus, who is God in the flesh, to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven. There's a reconciling happen, happening. There's a bringing back. There's a restoring relationship happening through Jesus, who is God in the flesh, and he's capable of doing it, right? That's why he has to be God, because no one else can make peace. No one else can give peace and accomplish peace and authoritatively declare you have peace unless he's God. So Jesus reconciling to the Father, everything in heaven, on earth, making peace by the blood of his cross. This goes back to the peace offerings we saw in Leviticus. Is that the blood of the animal, which was given to the people as a way to approach God, this way to draw near to God in the tabernacle, that blood would uh, make them accepted in his sight. It would be a gift, a friendly housewarming gift, you might say. Well, Jesus brings a far better housewarming gift that doesn't just temporarily uh, delay the consequences of sin and keep us under this temporary kind of ritual purity as a nation. Jesus brings eternal, um, never-ending, forever peace. 
because his sacrifice is exactly that. It's a once for all sacrifice. <clears throat> it's a one time for all sin. He's sufficient. He's perfect. He's blameless. He's eternal. He's infinite. He's, he's capable of making that kind of an offering to the Father as the perfect peace offering. And so he makes once and for all peace by his sacrifice, by laying down his life so we can have his peace with the Father. And that's why he takes our hostility and our evil upon himself. So the blood of Jesus, his lifeblood, which atones for sin, is what makes our peace. Our covenant with God is based on his son. I'm not upholding my end of the covenant with God. The terms and agreement, remember how God brings the terms of peace? He's not saying you uphold your end and I'll uphold my end. He's saying, actually, I'm coming down. The eternal word emanating from the Father is coming down to be and play our role and uphold our end of the covenant for us. And then the Father upholds his end of the covenant. So the Father and the Son on both ends of the covenant, I just have to trust in Jesus who will never fail, never make a mistake, and will never you know, mess up at upholding my end of the covenant. He's good. He represents humanity before the Father. And so our, the terms and agreement are based on and even written by, in the blood of Jesus. That secures our eternal redemption. He's written us in his will. The terms of the covenant are by and established by the blood of Jesus. And that's why I brought in the sacrificial offerings in the beginning. To let you know that yes, Jesus is your peace. He is. Now, what I'm going to do with this one is I actually, this was long enough to do a two-part series, okay? <clears throat> this is like a mini-series within the bigger series called Jesus is. But this is going to be, the next one we're going to talk about how to practically experience and walk in peace. Because now you know who brings peace. Now you know who is peace and gives peace and what that looks like and how that's possible and how he's foreshadowed in the Old Testament. You see that all. Now the practicality is, of, but how come I don't have that mental, emotional, soul level peace God supposedly offers me? I believe in his son. Where is it? Still schizophrenic, still anxious, still freaking out about my finances, still depressed. Like every other week, what's going on? Where's my peace? And so we're going to talk through the scriptures that actually touch these things and give us clarity on, well, how do you walk in peace? How do you enjoy peace? How do you practically experience what God has made available through his son? He's brought the terms of peace. You heard the message. You believed it. You trusted in the one who is your peace. Now, how do I experience that peace daily? That's what we're going to talk about the next episode. Don't miss it. Make sure you... Uh, Show up. Be there. All right.